geography of my work um, um, within, especially within uh, the Islamic uh, field and um, uh, with contemporary issues. Mainly there are three main fields. The first field is really connected to the very uh, substance of the Islamic teachings when it comes to the Islamic sciences, what we call the Islamic sciences, the sciences of the scriptural sources, the Quran as the revealed book, but also the prophetic tradition, the, is, the Islamic law and jurisprudence, the fundamentals of Islamic law and jurisprudence. This is one field where I have been working uh, and coming back to the tradition and setting something which has to do with the reformist tradition. The reformist tradition. So by saying this, I'm just saying that I'm not representing all the Muslims. And you don't have this very simplistic understanding when it comes to Islam that very often we have, not only in the media, by the way, it's quite uh, uh, an average take within our societies when we speak about bad Muslims, good Muslims, moderate Muslims, fundamentalist Muslims. So if you are not like me, you might be quite already a fundamentalist in a binary vision. This binary vision is very negative and it's wrong. You have six, seven different trends in Islam, from the literalist to the reformist, the Sufi, the politicized, the traditionalist. You have to study, it's complex. By saying this, I have been working in the reformist tradition saying two things. I take the texts seriously, but I'm also living in a specific context, times, are changing, environments are changing, so we have to deal with cultural issues, new environment, new questions, because we are facing new challenges in our time. So we need to be faithful to the principles and moving as to our understanding. My main position here is there is no faithfulness without evolution. So we have to reassess our understanding. Some Muslims, don't agree with this, and this is the intra-community dialogue which is necessary. So this is one field. The second field is, and has been for more than 25 years, to deal with challenges Western Muslims are facing and European Muslims are facing. When it comes to living here, being a European, what does it mean, what are the challenges, how do we deal with the new environment. So it's connected to the first part, but it's also very specific when it comes to our situation in the West and in Europe. So, for example, I never spoke about Euro-Islam, which is coming from Bassan TV, uh, and he was not happy that someone, a journalist, said this is Tariq Ramadan's uh, uh, concept. No, I never spoke about Euro-Islam. I speak about European Muslims, and I don't have a problem with European Islam if we explain what it means. It's Islamic as to the principles, it's accepting and integrating and shaped by the European culture as a living here because the cultural dimension is something that we are dealing with from the very beginning as Muslims. So the only way to be a Muslim is not to be an Arab, it's not to be a Pakistani, and it's not to be a Turk. It's to be a human being dealing with his or her environment. So this is the second field. The third field within which I have been working is, of course, Muslims in Muslim-majority countries. What are the challenges in which way they have to deal? And for example, there is a series uh, of books that I have been uh, writing and lectures that I have been giving in Muslim-majority countries uh, where I have been working on, for example, the last book is uh, The Arab Awakening, Islam and the New Middle East. It's already in French. It's going to be next month. Uh, but willing it will be in English. So these are the three fields and today what I want to do is to connect the three of them for you to understand what I'm trying to do and in which way now I'm trying to uh, uh, move within the Muslim majority countries, within the Muslim communities, but not only, also with intellectuals, scholars who are coming from other faiths, other traditions, to come to the common challenges of our time. And you will see this out of my uh, talk this evening. Third thing 
If you come to the, the last book I wrote on the Islamic tradition, and in which way we have to come back to the essence of our tradition as Muslims, I wrote a book which is very often read uh, in academic circle because it's not an easy book. The name is Radical Reform, Islamic Ethics and Liberation. And this book is really my main project. It's the end of almost 25 years dealing with the Islamic tradition, Islamic law and jurisprudence, uh, uh, spirituality, objectives, philosophy, Islamic philosophy and philosophy of law, and coming to something which is, how do we deal with this? At the center of this discussion is the main question of authority. That what we have today is we have scholars of the texts, so what we call ulama. These scholars are coming back to the scriptural sources and they are dealing with the scriptural sources and what they try to do is to understand the scriptural sources in the light of our time. So some are literalists and others, as I told you, are reformists, they are trying to understand. So they are involved in discussions and we have circles and we have councils where these scholars are coming together and trying to give to the Muslim majority countries as well as to the Muslim communities in the West what we call legal opinions. In Arabic is fatawa, or in sing the singular is fatwa. So they are trying to face the new challenges of our time when it comes to scientific challenges, when it comes to... Uh, and they try to find a way to deal with uh, uh, the new issues. And this is where, and this is connected to our topic, there is a connection between the scriptural sources and rationality and science and knowledge. Why? Because how are we going to deal with cloning? How are we going to deal with uh, new therapy and new technologies? How are we going to deal with new uh, 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 ecological questions and environment? It's not in the text, because the text was revealed in the 17th, in 7th century. We have to make our mind and to come with applied ethics and rationality. So what the scholars are trying to do is reread the text and come with new answers for today because they are facing the contemporary challenges of our time. This I have been working on that field with people and the great majority of my, my, uh, my uh, teachers when I was, because I went back to Egypt to get what we call in Arabic ijazat. Ijazat is the traditional way of being taught by scholars who give you at the end of your training the permission to be a teacher yourself. So you get the ijazat. I did this in, in six, seven fields altogether to be able to get all the Islamic sciences and I, went, I was coming from the traditional way of teaching. And I was dealing with this, except that after 20 years, I realized that I was myself reaching the limit. That all what we have been doing in that field, coming from the scholars, was, yes, we use our rationality, yes, we are trying to be faithful to the text, but we look at the world, and the world is changing, and we come with new legal opinions that are helping us to adapt to the world the way it is, in a very defensive way. So the world is changing, we are dealing with new freedom, with new knowledge, with new technology, and what we are doing is we come with new rules to protect ourselves from the world which is changing. And my main point when I came to all the traditions, when I went, for example, because I spent time in India and I went to deal with the Buddhist tradition, I wanted to understand, I, 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 I spent time with the Dalai Lama trying to understand the spirituality, I, I spent time with priests from the theologian uh, uh, liberation theology in South America, understanding what they wanted to do. What I understood from the Jewish tradition, the Buddhist tradition, and even my own tradition, is not to look at the world the way it is and to adapt myself to it, but in the name of my values and my ethics, is to change the world for the better. It's not to look at the world and say, oh, the world is changing, let us change our religion. No, we have to change our mind, but there are principles that are not negotiable. Justice, dignity, freedom, ethics, to respect nature. So it's not because the world is changing that we have to run after the world the way it is and to say, you know what, I'm a modern, I'm doing as all the people are doing. So to be consumerists, 
because it's time of consumption to be selective in the way we deal with the world. And then I realized, and this is the main uh, uh, theme of the book, radical reform meant that I don't want, and I, this was my discovery after 20 years, which was quite deep and difficult, is there are two types of reform. There is one which is adaptational reform, that you adapt yourself to the world and you try to catch up. And it's coming from a de defensive posture and at the same time, at the same time, a minority complex on an inferiority complex. Because it's so good over there, we do the same. Because they have power, let us do the same. Because the world is changing, let us catch up. So defensive as to the principle and always catching up. So it's adaptational reform. And I came to a point where I think we have to advocate, and this is the very essence of all the philosophies, and not only coming from spirituality and religions, atheists, agnostics, uh, religious people, or spiritual people, when they come with ethics is to say, we need a transformational reform, not an adaptational reform. Is to reform in order to change the world for the better. So how are we going to deal with our text to make up our mind to find new answers for new challenges that are helping us to have a better life? It's not only to adapt ourselves to the democratic process, but it's to think about the democratic process to go from democratic governance to good governance. And good governance is the ethical dimension that is needed. So it was a critical take within connecting open and critical rationality with faith and faithfulness to principles. How are we going to do this? And in all the philosophical trend and environment, it's called applied ethics. So ethics is what are the values that you are trying to reach. For example, if you know I'm a European, what I want today, let alone being a Muslim, but as a human being, I want more ethics in economy. I want more ethics in politics. I want more ethics in ecology, environment. This is my main point. I want my ethics to help me to be a better person, to be a better citizen, and to be a better human being, respecting nature, respecting others, respecting differences, and respecting uh, uh, the, the world the way it is. So the main point was this, and this is where I started to work transversally, it's not for Western Muslims only, and it's not for Muslims living in major, Muslim majority countries, it's for every human being, being critical as to our tradition. And it's called Islamic ethics and liberation. Liberating our minds, liberating our hearts, liberating our being from any kind of alienation. Meaning by this, that the alienation could be a self-alienation. When you put yourself on the defensive, then you nurture the victim mentality, you are self-alienating yourself. So it's to be assertive and to know what is your memory, what is your history, what are your values. And not to look at the West, and not to look at the others as the dominant, and us as the victim. Spiritually, spiritually socially, stand up. Now it's time to change. Now it's time to contribute. So this is coming from within the tradition. And this is why, two weeks ago, I started to translate everything which was in this book, Radical Reform, because many people came to me and said, you know what, Tarek, all this is good, but it's very theoretical and you have lots of questions and no answers. And by the way, the starting point of getting answers is to ask the right questions in a humble way. And then I started a center. Two weeks ago, we started a center, which is in Qatar, connected to what I'm doing in Oxford and what I'm doing in the West. So it's a connection between the Muslim majority countries and the West, a center for Islamic legislation, ethics. Ethics is questioning the objective and coming back to the rules. Never implement a rule without questioning the objective of the rule. Because a little rule could be uh, betraying the objective of the rule. And we know this when it comes to any legal uh, implementation. You need to remain 
aware of the objectives that you want to achieve. So ethics and legislation to be critical and to do the work and starting to work in seven to eight fields. And these are critical fields. First is the Islamic tradition, but also gender, men and women. And when I, I, if you go on my website and you listen, it's in Arabic, but you have the English and the French translation. I was saying, I don't want to go to this business of as Muslims, because this is where we are coming from very often to speak about women, rights and, and duties. I have a problem with the way we are even asking the question about women in Islam. I would prefer for us to speak about men in Islam. Because one of the main problems of women is men. So all the women are happy here. Uh, but it might be that we have to understand that, but it's transversal. By the way, in all our societies, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a father, today, the question of questioning the authority, the traditional authority is critical. So it's about gender, men and women, it's about environment, it's about economy, it's about arts, it's about uh, ecology, as I said, it's about education. Seven fields, it's about psychology, it's also about media, questioning in these fields what we have been saying as Muslims and to come from a, an adaptational reform to a transformational reform. And how do we go from this to that is to question our methodology. I don't want the scholars of the text to look at the world not knowing what is happening. Oh, by the way, there is medicine also in the field. To look at the world and to come with legal opinions when they don't know what the world is. They need to have expertise. They need to get the knowledge at the highest level. You want applied ethics in medicine? You need to hide the highest level of knowledge in medicine. If not, you are giving legal opinion on something you don't know. So you try to catch up, and by definition, you will be in an adaptational mode. You have to change this. How? To get with scholars of the text and scholars of the context and to put them together in councils, to work together having both knowledges, and you have to work together to understand how are you going to deal with the complexity of the contemporary knowledge and the principles of your text. Let us come together. And by the way, I don't want the scholars of the text to be only Muslims. Scholars of the context, they should be people getting the knowledge. Economists, they can be Muslim, non-Muslim coming. The way it's done is we need your expertise and you need your knowledge. As long as you have an ethical concern, you are interesting with your knowledge. So economists, people coming from other, and when we launched the, 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 the center, we were having people coming from other traditions, always no tradition, but having an ethical concern. We need to connect knowledge with objectives and meaning. Knowledge without meaning is what Rabelais was saying, is uh, science without conscience is but the ruin, the ruin of the soul. You are being lost if you don't come with this knowledge. So this is something which is important why? Because this will have an impact on everything else that I'm trying to do in the West and in Muslim majority countries. You understand in which way it's quite radical. It means let us come to a constructive contributing presence wherever we are in all these fields and in everything which has to do with our understanding. So this is the, these are the pillars, these are the fundamentals of what I'm trying to do, to do from within the Islamic tradition and it's important not only for Muslims, it's important for people from other faiths to understand that this is not something which is completely alien to the Islamic tradition. I'm talking from within the tradition and if you read the text uh, in the book you can see that the fundamentals are coming from a tradition. But why is it important? Because if we are serious about pluralism, don't sit down and speak about pluralism by saying that you are tolerant because you tolerate the people from other faiths. To tolerate is not enough. If you are serious about pluralism, you have to learn, you have to read, you have to meet people, you have to know who they are, what they stand for and what they want. If you want to respect me, don't talk about what you heard about me. You need to understand the substance of my hope. How are you going to get that? How are you going to get the substance of my hope? If you don't meet with me, you don't read what is said within the tradition, you don't, you don't get in three minutes through YouTube the meaning of the hopes 
of a, a civilization. It takes effort. Pluralism takes effort. Respect takes effort. Dignity takes effort. It means that you have to be a citizen. And you have to be, to be a citizen, it means you have to be a human being. And to be a human being is use your mind, use your heart, use your time to do something useful out of that. So this is the first part. The second is, with all this, what I have been trying to do in the field of Western Muslims is to say, look, I myself is a product of this Western experience. Born and raised in Switzerland almost 50 years ago. And I still have some of my fellow citizens coming to say, hmm, are you a true Swiss citizen? questioning my citizenship because they see too much of Islam in my being. And this is where I started the whole discussion. I'm not going to let anyone define me and reduce me to the object of her or his perception. I'm the subject of my history. So now I want to reconcile myself with my past, my memory and my presence here. Meaning, coming back to the scriptural sources, but not only, and also the history of my family and the history of our societies. Why are we here and what are we trying to do? And the first thing that I, starting to, I started to say when I, I was talking about Western Muslims is really about <coughs> anything which has to do with uh, this uh, host society, and you are an immigrant, and after four generations, when you are a Muslim, you are a citizen with an immigrant background for four generations. I said, let's stop now here. We stop it now. And we start by saying, look, I was born in the country. Some of the people who are here are here. It's the second, the third generation. So now, not only they have to say, but to have they feel, this is home. You are at home and you are Europeans and you are Belgian and you are uh, British and you are French and you are Dutch. You are at home. So it's to define something which is a historical experience. Change your mind. Don't have your heart there and your body here. Reconcile your heart and your body. This is home. And when you look at the people around you and you look at this society, you should be able to say, my people. Not them and us. And if you have people saying you and us, the first question is to say, who is this us you are talking about? Who are you that you are telling me us and you are putting me outside this us? Good news, I am one of you us. <laughs> I am one of you. Because this is home for me. But not only is it a discourse, it's a feeling. And the way we do is this, and we deal with it, is something which is very important. It's not against Islam to abide by the law of the country. It's in the name of my religion that I abide by the law of the country because these laws are my laws. And anyone who is telling you the only time when I'm going to resist to the law of the country, it's if these laws are not respecting my dignity and the two main uh, uh, principles, freedom of conscience and freedom of worship. All the European countries and the Western countries as the essence of their law is based on the two main principles, freedom of conscience, freedom of worship. So I abide by the law of the country, and this is my country. Of course, sometimes I may not be happy with the way they are implemented. So are all the citizens. That we are not always happy the way they are implemented. That we have to struggle. This is to be a citizen. A citizen is someone who is aware. By the way, a citizen, by definition, is active. A passive citizen is a contradiction in terms. You can't be a passive citizen. A citizen, by definition, is active for her or his right, and questioning the implementation of the law is not enough to have law written. We have to struggle for them to be rightly enforced in our society. So, this is to say I'm at home. And this is where I started to write on this by saying, I don't want to come to the old Islamic uh, terminology saying we have the abode of Islam and the abode of war, Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Hal. All this is outdated. I'm at home here. 
And the only thing which is important for me as a citizen in Europe, a Swiss citizen or a European citizen, is to be a witness before people of the consistency of my values. So what I'm expecting from a Christian, what I'm expecting from a Jew, what I'm expecting from a Buddhist or a Hinduist, or what I'm expecting from an atheist, and what I'm expecting from an agnostic is I have no right to impose onto you anything. The only thing that I want to see out of you is for you to be a witness of your values. Show me through your behavior how much you are consistent with your value. That's it. Be consistent with what you believe in. You are claiming that you want dignity and justice and, and understanding. Show it to me. Be consistent. Be a witness of your message. Don't be converted by my message, but be sincere with yours. So show me who you are, what you do. And this is exactly what I have to do as a Western, a European Muslim citizen, just to be a witness. This is why I call the world today the abode of witness. But not only for Muslims, for any single human being. Just be a witness to your behavior of your values. So you understand here how much trying to open up, to universalize the message by being faithful but open. Because this is, the, you know, when people are on the defensive, they think that they are faithful when they close the doors. When you are confident, you are faithful when you open the doors. I don't have a problem. Come. We can talk. Tell me what are your values. What are you doing with your values? Are you really sincere with dignity? So let me tell you. I'm a European, you are a European. Are we really sincere when we treat the immigrants the way we treat them? Are the immigrants less human beings than us? So it might be that as citizens, you and me, we have to do something to treat the immigrants in a more dignified way. Because they might be poor there, but the way we treat them is not the right way. Are you consistent with the way you are saying that you want to, to respect the environment? So let us ask ourselves the way we are dealing with our daily life. Are we consistent with the way we are dealing with the environment? All these questions are common questions. C civic questions. Essential, existential questions. And this is where we have to come together as human beings. And this is what we have to do. Now, having said that, that I am home. And very often, you know, when I'm dealing with people, they have, I don't know why, or maybe I know why. That sometimes when I am in Switzerland, when I arrive at the desk, you know, at the borders with my passport, some have a problem between my passport and my face. It's not exactly what a Swiss should be. But don't, don't it's not a joke. That the perception is quite negative. That very often the people, when they talk to me, they put me out of what they think I am outside our us. So a few years ago, I launched, and you can find the text in, uh, in the book, the, uh, What I Believe, but also I put it on the website, first page, the manifesto for a new we. This country facing the same challenges. We might have different backgrounds, but at the end, we have the same future. We are coming from different routes, but the future is the same. And if you are not convinced, let us come with our kids. They will tell you what you cannot understand. They might be ahead of you in history. They have the common future together. And then comes something which is essential in our discussion is identity. And what I was saying, my identity is to be a European by culture. But I don't deny the fact that I am a Muslim, so I am a Muslim by religion. And I don't deny the fact that I am a Swiss, so I am a Swiss by nationality. And I don't deny the fact that I have a richness which is coming with me that I'm bringing to Europe and that Europe should understand it's a gift that I'm Egyptian by memory. And it's great to come with something from Egypt to help the European countries to get some richness. And it's also, it's very easy for an Egyptian. Because when you are coming with the Egyptian civilizations, no one can tell you what it is all about. See? You don't know about the Egyptians, so someone who is telling you this is more saying something about his or her ignorance that of the greatness of this Egyptian civilization. So it's easy, but it's not always easy when you are Turk, Turkish, when you are Moroccan, when you are Algerian. Some people don't know about the richness of the Moroccan civilization and culture. Now they start getting it with tajini and some exotic food. And they like it. 
Algerian, North African, Pakistani, all these cultures are getting something. And this is why I came with something which is essential for our common future. We all have multiple identities. And if you reduce yourself by saying, I'm only one thing, you are reduct, re reducing yourself on a defensive mode which is not good for yourself. And the populist trends that are now winning everywhere in Europe, they are doing exactly this. They are creating emotional politics and bathing their policy on fear and targeting the people saying they are not like us. So we have only one identity. Reducing the identity to something. And I'm saying to the citizens, the European citizens, Muslims and people of other faiths, Christian and whatever, don't let the populist reduce your identity to one single identity. Because this is very dangerous. You have multiple identities and you have to open up. And the Muslims should understand that they are not only Muslim. They are Belgian by nationality and they are European now by culture. And there is nothing wrong to add languages to languages. By speaking Dutch, by speaking French, by speaking Arabic, by speaking whatever, add to your identity and don't subtract because this subtraction is problematic. This is exactly what the xenophobic attitude is doing. Reducing yourself to one dimension. This is me. So this is where I started working about, I don't have a problem. I am a Muslim by religion, a European by culture, and my Islam is going to be one Islam as to the principles and European by culture. And this was always like this. African Muslims are African by culture and Muslim by religion. No problem. In Turkey it's the same. In Morocco it's the same. So I'm not asked to remain an Egyptian Muslim in Europe. I can be a European Muslim faithful to the principles but living in my time with my culture, speaking the language of my country and having a way of life which is both connected to my principles and in my new cultural environment. That's it. With confidence. And the key word here is confidence. When the people... We need to go to something which is when there is an evolution of mistrust, we need a revolution of trust. And this is the point. Who are the people you are trusting? Because I'm always saying to people, and even the Muslims, they are doing exactly the same, isolating themselves among themselves, and they say they don't like us. And the people outside are saying, oh, these Muslims are not like us. So between they don't like us and they are not like us, there is miscommunication. So ask yourself, over, you are here in this room, it's full of people, how many people from different backgrounds and culture have you talked with over the last months? Who are the people you are talking to? Are the people who are like you, so you are open-minded among similar people? In your own world, it's not to be open-minded. It's to be in a cultural jail without knowing it. And you think you are open. You are open within the jail. The jail of your own people and not understanding that your society is changing. Belgium today is not the Belgium of yesterday. It's changing. Open up. And for the people who are Muslims, open up. And if the people think that you are problematic, show how much you are sharing the same hopes and the same uh, uh, future and the same principles, especially for your uh, uh, kids. Having said that now, it's also something which is important, and I have been repeating this, that my way of dealing uh, with European Islam and, and the way uh, I'm, I'm putting it now, you can understand what I mean, because some Muslims sometimes they don't understand. Some are saying, oh, he's coming with a new Islam. No, I'm just coming with an Islam which is faithful to the principles and uh, dealing with a new environment. And there is nothing wrong, with confidence. But there is one point which is important. For almost 30, 40 years, now we are reaching in some countries, in Belgium, France, and uh, uh, Germany, and, and uh, and Britain, the fourth generation of Western Muslims and European Muslim presence. Now, we keep on repeating integration. And I was putting it very simply. The success of integration is to stop talking about integration. 
So you have to stop asking the people, when are you going to integrate? I am integrated. Your mind should integrate that I am integrated. That I am at home now. And I am dealing with it in this way. So we have to stop and we have to come with a key word, a new one, which is to go from integration to contribution. Be an active citizen. Be someone who is contributing in all the fields, not only when it comes to Islam, we saw Muslims, or we see Muslims, when, it, when we talk about education, civil rights, society, any, any, any new topic, any, anything which is important for my society is my concern. So when it comes, for example, you know, when we deal with some people, the only thing that they, they, they think we have to talk about when it comes to women is the right to wear the headscarf. My position on this is the position of 80% of the European countries, 89% of the European countries. It's against Islam to impose unto a woman to wear the headscarf is against human rights to impose unto a woman to take it off. Let the people do what they have to do, what they want to do. It's not your business the way I dress. And if I want to, that's, that's the point. But my main problem is not every time I speak about women, I speak about the way they dress. I have a concern which is a common concern. Why is it that in our societies in Europe now, we are in 2012, why is it that a woman with the same skills and the same study and the same uh, years of study get in the great majority of the works and the jobs, 70% less than a man. This is my main concern. My main concern is not tell me the way I have to dress. No, come to why are we facing discriminations in salaries? This is the right question to ask. Why are you putting all your concern in culturalizing the issue of women in our society? The main discussion is, are they have the same access to job market? Are we talking about financial independence? And for the same skills, I want the same salary. This is my answer. This is why we have to come together. But we keep on targeting the Muslim by saying, tell me the way you dress. I will tell you the way you are free in my mind. What a reductive way of dealing with the issue. What a reductive way. And very often, the Muslims themselves, they fall into the trap. I keep on, on this discussion saying, I don't want to talk about this, it's not of your business. <coughs> if I decided to wear this the way I wear it, that's my business. Now, if there is, and I will be the first to say, if there is a father or a brother or a family imposing into a woman to wear the headscarf, I will be on her side to say, it's not your business the way your daughter and the way your sister is dressed. Let her decide for herself. This is a personal choice. It's not for you to tell her the way she has to dress. Why? Because it's an act of faith and there is no compulsion in any act of faith. Let the people decide. But we have to be consistent with this because many Muslims are happy with the first thing I said and when I say this, oh, not clear. I hope it's clear. I hope it's clear on both sides. Last point. Last point. Uh, and I come to my conclusion because I was asked to work to talk for 45 minutes. And if I'm right, as a Swiss citizen, I still have four minutes. <laughs> yeah. I have no choice anyway. Uh, four minutes. But I wanted to say the last thing. Because over the last few uh, uh, months, I have been uh, connecting also all my work with what is happening in the Muslim-majority countries and what we call the Arab Spring and revolutions. I, call, I don't call them revolutions, I don't call it an Arab Spring. I'm just talking about an Arab awakening and I'm talking about uprisings, not yet achieved revolution. I have a question mark on what is happening still, even though there is a difference between the countries and we have to be very, very much aware of what is happening in Tunisia and evolving, which is quite interesting in Tunisia. It's completely different from Egypt and the situation is very worrying over there and very worrying and very sad in Syria. Well, let me say that I don't want a military intervention. 
But I think that the West could have been much more, could have done much more to protect the civilians by putting more pressure on this government that is killing innocent people. And we know this from the very first week, torturing and killing young boys aged 12 or 15. So this is unacceptable. But what is happening now in Syria, in Libya, in other countries, it's quite worrying. And I think that it might be that we are facing now one success and many failures or an achieved revolution. The point here is something which is quite interesting for me. And let me uh, bring to the fore four main points and I will stop. It will be my conclusion. But I want you to connect this because I'm also dealing with Muslim majority countries. And all that I'm trying to do with radical reform and this new way of dealing with the sources is also connected to this. Remember that when it started, many people were saying, oh, what about the Islamists? What about political Islam? And then, after studying what was happening in Tunisia, in Egypt, in other countries, it was quite clear that these young women and men were not Islamists. They were citizens, young and not so young, saying three things. First, we don't want you to stay here. They, this, they were saying to the dictator, get out of here. We don't want Erhan. In Arabic, dégage. In French. Uh, and this is what was said in Tunisia, saying to the dictator, we don't want you, and it won't harm, we don't want the regime. The second thing which was important is, we want freedom and democracy. We want to choose our leaders. And the third thing that they were asking is dignity. We want to be dignified and to be treated with dignity. Something which is quite interesting is that very quickly, what was said in the West was, wow, they are like us. That's good. These are progressive men and women. And you know what? What was quite interesting in the media, very often, we forgot that they were Muslims. It's as if when they are like us, they should be less Muslim to be like us. Which, in fact, they were not acting against the sun, they were acting as young and not so young Muslims, acting for dignity, freedom, democracy, and no dictatorship. Which is exactly the essence of what I have been saying for 25 years in the West. Your fellow Muslim citizens want exactly what you want, dignity, justice, and freedom. So if you listen to what is said there, you understand what is have been said here. And if you are unable to listen to your fellow citizens in the way they want to be treated here as human beings and not to have this culturalizing every discussion, it's as if when we have social problems with uh, uh, young uh, Belgium citizens, it's because they are Muslims or they are Moroccan or they are Turkish. No, it's because we don't have a social policy dealing with schools, dealing with justice, dealing with employment. We have a problem and we need social justice and we need social policies. We don't need discussion about religious belonging. We need what is the policy that you are going to implement in the country. What are you doing with uh, you know, suburbs and, and, and marginalization and violence? This is what is needed. So we should stop culturalizing. In fact, what happened in the Middle East and in North African country is what was revealing. When we stopped talking about them and they were like us, we forgot that, in fact, they want the same things and they have the same objectives as us being Muslims in Muslim majority countries. So this was the starting point of the story. And then what happened is that after uh, the, process, the processes and, and, and the elections, we had a new concern. So the, 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 the majority uh, uh, trends there were Islamists from political Islam. And we started asking, oh, in Nahda in Tunisia and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, they are now gaining, and some were saying, Look at this. We give them freedom, or they got freedom, and now they are voting for political Islam. And the point is that we, try, we started to have this discussion, this polarized discussion between secularists and Islamists in Tunisia and in Egypt. And at the end of the day, we are exactly at the point where we need now, and, and uh, part of the book that I wrote on this was really to say, this is exactly where the contemporary Muslim conscience is facing its deepest crisis. It's not coming from the West. 
It's coming from within, where the people are struggling for structure or the structure of the state and not coming to the deep question of our time, which is, what is going to be your educational policy? What is going to be your economic policy? What is going to be your way of dealing with justice? Instead of just coming about the structure of the state, we have challenges. Why don't you come to the deep discussion and stop fighting on legitimacy? Because by just opposing to the to opposing yourself or opposing the others is just a way to legitimize, to legitimize. So you have Islamists saying to the secularists, you are westernized and we are the guardians of the tradition. And on the other side, you have secularists saying to the Islamists, you are religious, you are uh, uh, promoting theocracy, and we are modern. And the both sides are getting legitimacy by the criticism, not by being self-critical and not by coming with a new project. And this is what we need to face. And this is why you understand the very essence of the radical reform, which is come to the right questions. And at the same time, us in the West, we have a very important role to play by saying we want to question the objectives. What are you going to achieve as the main question? And this is what I'm advocating in the text by saying, and this is the second point quickly, is there are lots of questions that are important. First, we need to go towards what is now called the civil state and not to be obsessed with a very close understanding of what could be an Islamic state is the civil state. And you can see now, and it started in Turkey, but also in Algeria, in Morocco, in Egypt, in Tunisia, people are talking about the civil state, Dawla Madaniya, meaning we can be inspired by our tradition, we can be inspired by our value, but the main point is not to uh, uh, go towards a state that is going to be discriminatory or being just exclusive for the Muslims and not for the others. So we have to deal with a democratic state, an open state. But having said that, there are questions that are important. When it comes, for example, to the economic policy and the vision for the future, because you will not get I'm finishing. I'm still in my time, I think. Um, uh, now I'm, I'm adding a uh, few minutes. Uh, quickly, what is important is not is to get it right. You are not going to get true transparent democracies in the Middle East, in North Africa, if you don't get economic stability. So are we going to be happy just to have uh, democracies under control? Because the, there are big questions now. It's not, you know, if you just deal with the Arab Spring, as it is called, through the political side, and you don't get it right, we are facing now in the Middle East competitions between China, India, the United States of America. They are competing, and for example, over the last seven years, China... So this is, I, I, I thought it was seven, I came back to the figures, it's by eight. So it's very, a very important presence. And you can see in Syria that Russia and China, they don't want Bashar Assad to leave because they have interest there. So if you don't get something which is which kind of economic policy, and this is where I would like the, 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 the new democracies there, the new Middle East, to deal much more with a South-South relationship to open more towards East and not only to be obsessed with the hyperpower of the United States of America or the Europeans. Are they going to do this? Or are they going just to integrate within the system which is problematic in itself? We have to deal with questions like this one to question also, are we happy with the Asian capitalism? China is coming with a very strong capitalist system minus democratic values. So we, we should not be only happy, oh, China is coming. We also have to question the system, which is behind the whole consumerist attitude, and this is important. There are two other fields that are so important. Education in the Middle East. No real freedom for citizens if we don't question this, the, the, the educational system. Who is questioning now this? When we have for, for poverty, when we don't have an educational system, where the elites are sending their kids to Europe to get knowledge. On both sides, 
Islamists and secularists, they send their kids where? They are in Morocco, they are in Algeria, they are in Egypt, where? In the United States of America or in France. Which future are you going to create if you are sending the, the best generations elsewhere? This is a deep question here. And the last one is about a cultural uh, uh, understanding. What should be important is to come back to the genius of your tradition. Which kind of art, which kind of creativity, which poetry. This is something which is so essential. The future is not only about a political system, it's about a culture, it's about richness, it's about well-being. Exactly what we are saying here should be also there. You know in the book, The Quest for Meaning, I'm saying that everywhere you go, we need to reconcile our kids with four disciplines. The first one, they have to re-learn history. Second, they have to learn philosophy, the deep questions of life. Third, the history of religions. If you are serious about pluralism, you need to know not only your religion, but about all the other spiritualities and religions. And the last one, which is something that we are very missing, and it's good to say this in a theater, in this room, and in where you have multiple functions here, arts and imagination should be taught as something which is essential. The best thing that you can get in your knowledge is to be open to arts, imagination, and creativity. These are things that are so important. So you can understand here that all what I'm saying about what is happening in the Middle East, these deep questions, are not far from our questions. And the Western Muslim should be involved in this discussion. And all of us, we need to do something which is important, to reconcile ourselves with the values that we are promoting. If you are serious about dignity, you are serious about justice, serious about respecting nature and the environment, let us be consistent here and consistent with the South and support all these movements that are trying to do this and please don't judge the political parties before just assessing what they are doing. Because there is something which is common in all the political parties. Muslims and non-Muslims, they say very often things before that they are not going to implement after. So let us wait and judge and be critical in a constructive way. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of questions. Let me just try to, to, to summarize and come to, to the first question. To summarize not your questions, but my answer. Uh, the first is, it's a very old discussion, this relationship between faith, belief, and rationality. And there is something which is uh, quite important in the Islamic tradition from the very beginning, is to try to reconcile the two. And we have a very old tradition, philosophical tradition. Unfortunately, the Muslims from within, they are very often ignorant of this tradition. You know, one of the great Muslim scholars, the greatest Muslim scholars. He was at the same time a jurist, a philosopher, and a Sufi, Abu Hamid al Hazel. was saying something which was quite interesting about this relationship. He was saying, meaning the message is an outward revelation. In my mind, my intellect, my mind is an inward revelation. Saying that I have truths that are coming from the scriptural sources and truth and understanding that are coming from my mind, my intellect. And there should be no contradiction. So the very essence is there is no contradiction. But now, it's quite important to know what you believe and in which way you are being critical with the way you believe. Meaning that at one point, you should have the right with your intellect to question what is in your heart. So what you believe. So this critical thinking is something which is very important in the Islamic tradition, was important and very often lost in the course of history because, as I said, we are on the defensive, so we come with the rules and we forget the meaning. So even in our way of practicing Islam today, some are praying five times a day, and they pray for respecting the rules, not getting the very meaning of it. The way we fast is exactly the same. We fast one month, and it's a rule, it's a, an, an obligation, 
but we need to reconcile what you do with the objective of what you do. So, how do you get this? It's the way you educate people, through education. Let the young Muslim women and men ask questions, being critical. This critical thinking, this reassessment of why I'm doing things is something which is important. This is the first point, if I may, before you add, uh, uh, 33 questions, uh, all the questions to ask because it's quite difficult, but just uh, the second part of it is in the field of uh, legal and fair today, no one can deny the fact that scholars came with new answers for new challenges. No one can deny the fact that we have uh, legal opinions in medicine, in society, this is coming. Now the question is the nature of this new, uh, new uh, 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 thoughts. Many of them are very useful because they help the Muslims to deal, to deal, to deal with new, uh, uh, new uh, uh, challenges. You know, people don't know, but if you come to medical sciences, for example, you have the Muslim scholars came with opinions at the most updated uh, uh, dimension of medical sciences. You have, for example, in euthanasia, <coughs> Islamic uh, legal opinions that are dealing with the fact that passive euthanasia is possible. So they are dealing with this, for example, in anything which has to do uh, 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 with procreation, in vitro, and all this. We have legal opinions. So the, the scholars are coming with new opinions in specific fields, not in all the fields. And sometimes they are coming with adaptation or, you know, uh, position. My main concern here is to carry on this work and to come with something which is going a step further than that, with remaining faithful and using our active rationality just to understand that the way you, we deal with this knowledge should help us to be faithful to the principles but also coming with uh, a better understanding of the world today. Yeah. So basically, what I wanted really to know is how. Yes, you're so right. My no, no, you're right. You're right. It's I even that missed there your is question. like a history of, <laughs> of, of rationality, of reasoning, of philosophizing, and everything. But at the, at the end, belief does also exist out of like you know principles that are fixed in a way. And what I want to know is how can we you know what is the difference between what is fixed and what we can change and how flexible are Muslims in that how can they use their reason to to, to deal with things that are very fixed praying fasting these are all elements that are very founded and you cannot change them but that does make you know this you know um, the, 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 the relation between reason and yeah. and belief very difficult you know yes and no because, no, no, it's not a diplomatic answer, it's a philosophical answer. Uh, Blaise Pascal, who was a French philosopher, was saying that one of the main, the, the most important quality of reason is to understand the limits of reason. That you cannot get everything out of reason. Sometimes there are things that you have to stop. And we all know here something which is very important, and you will understand why I'm saying this. There is something which is never completely rational. It's love. You don't know why you love someone, because sometimes you can have someone who is have more qualities, and still you love this one and not that one. Why? Because your heart is talking, not your mind. Sometimes it's exactly the same. The relationship with God, the relationship with your belief is not only reduced to your rationality. So what we have in Islam is that there are three fields where you have to come with a humble rationality. Saying, I am not going to understand everything, but it's a question of heart. The same Blaise Pascal was saying, sometimes your heart has its reasons, your reason don't, doesn't understand. So that's true, that's very true. That for example, when you say, I believe in God, it's coming with your heart and your mind, that you look at the world and your mind is telling you, your mind can tell you 
that beyond this world there is a creator. So your mind could direct you towards him, but your heart say, it's my relationship. What you are asked, and this is true in the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition, and the Islamic tradition, your relationship with God is a love story. What you need to get is to love him. And what you get in Islam is three fields. The first one is what we call the creed, al-aqidah, the six pillars of faith, that you acknowledge they are there because you believe in the book, and this is why you are a Muslim, you believe that this was cre uh, revealed, and it is said about the, cre uh, the, the, the presence of God, the messengers, the books, that you believe in this, even though you haven't seen them. Six pillars of faith. You have also five pillars of practice, that you pray five times a day. Now you are asking this field to suspend your rationality to get the meaning of everything, but to say, okay, I know that this is what God is asking me to do. So out of my love, I will pray, I will fast, I will give zakat. So this is an act of faith. It's not to be reduced that everything is 100% rational, even though if you use your reason, you understand what you have to pray five times a day. Because in between, you are very quick to forget. So faith is all about remembrance. So you have a rational understanding, but not a, a reductive, rational explanation of everything. And then you have also things that you can understand out of your rationality, but you have to do because it's coming from your religion. You don't drink alcohol. So rationally, you can understand why you don't drink alcohol. You can understand why, because it is said in the Quran, so avoid it, because there are more disadvantages than advantages. So I know that the people in this room who like alcohol, they say, oh, we don't get that. Uh, but still, uh, from a Muslim viewpoint, from women, when you believe in it, you can get that. And you can understand. So many of the things that are coming out of your face are not reductible to rationality, but sometimes understandable to rationality. Having said that now, in my daily life, there are many things that are going to come out of my rationality, that I need to get an, an applied ethics, that my contemporary rationality could help me to get. And this is where the Muslims should go beyond a, a very strict implementation of the rule to come to a deep understanding of the meaning. I can give you an example that I'm always saying to all the Muslims. We know as Muslims that we eat what we call halal meat. So halal meat is the way the animal uh, is slaughtered by being very strict in the way which is a spiritual way to say this animal I can only give uh, uh, death or to slaughter in the name of my relationship to God because I'm going to eat and not more than that. I can't kill for anything else but to eat animals. Now having said that, many of the Muslims today and especially in the West are coming with the rule without rationality. They are missing the point of meaning. So they are obsessed with the way we kill the animal and not the way we treat the animal when alive. But when you come back to the very essence of Islam, no, the way you treat the animal is as important as the way you kill it. And why? Because you have to treat the animal in the best, be, the good way. You have to avoid <coughs> suffering. You have to avoid uh, anything which is hurting the animal and uh, uh, making it suffering. When you get this, you ask the Muslims today, please, if you are serious about your religion, you should be at the forefront of any struggle to protect the animal life and dignity. This is what it means to come with your intellect and your rationality and not to come with a simplistic way of dealing with rule in the name of your faith without dealing with ethics in the name of your rationality. So, yes, indeed, like, you know, what you said about practice is, you know, in first instance of remembering things, that's why we practice in remembering God. We do a lot of, uh, of all these things, you know, for, because of our love for, for, for Allah. But 
So there are fixed things which you call a tabit, yes? But then there are things that, you know, which you call mutagayyir, things that could change. And I don't think, you know, we are really, as also speaking as a Muslim, we are aware in which sense jurisprudence, you know, can change, you know, certain rules change. For example, what you said about euthanasia, all these changing conditions, I mean, how, 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 there are many people who are not, you know, uh, aware of these transformations because on the one hand you see here, like in daily reality, you know, uh, uh, you know, basically discussions about Muslim women who don't go to Muslim men and all these things, you know, who, uh, who don't go to doctor, uh, non-Muslim doctors and all the all these things basically, I mean, kind of like indicate that Muslims are not really aware of the changing dimensions in uh, Islamic theology. So how can you explain this? this yeah, I think you are, you, are, you are completely right. I think that very often the scholars are ahead in many. Also a question of questioning the scholars uh, with the right questions. It's, it's really to come with the right questions. For example, in the center, yeah. very, we very much want to get the right questions in specific fields because very often the questions that the scholars uh, uh, get are very simplistic and, and very formal. We need to go deep. For example, in economy, we have to come. In, in medicine, we have to come with deep questions. Now, you are touching here a point which is central the communication between some of the rules or, or what has been proposed and the knowledge within the Muslim majority societies and the community. And there is a gap. There is a gap and, and people, they don't know about euthanasia, they don't know even about, uh, you know, uh, uh, procreation and, and in vitro procreation and all this. Well, we have fatawa on this. Even, for example, I can tell you something about abortion that many Muslims are keep on repeating things that it's as if we are following in the footsteps of the Christian tradition, which is completely wrong. We had, from the very beginning, uh, dealing with abortion, yes, uh, the general ruling is avoid it. But now we have specificities when we are dealing with, for example, rape, or we are dealing with problems of, you know, uh, 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 not normal child or questions about the future, where yeah. scholars are coming with very interesting uh, uh, fatawa, and the people don't know. And this is this is where we need to promote a better education. <laughs> For example, we were talking just before about the center. One of the main tools of the center is to have a website that has and, and connection with people to reach out, to let the people know about these opinions and the legal opinions in many of the fields. For example, when uh, you have Muslims coming and saying uh, for a Muslim woman or a Muslim man it's not possible to go to uh, 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 for a woman, for a, 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 a doctor. Uh, was was, doctor. I, was, I, I didn't know. <laughs> I was confused with my own way of putting it. But for a woman to go to see a, 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 a male doctor or, or for a, a man to go to see a male doctor and you say, oh, that's not possible, that's completely wrong. And we have lots of traditions and lots of opinions saying in the medical field we don't have a problem with this. In a society where you can choose, choose, but in a situation where you have to face in medical situation a male when you are a female or the opposite, no problems, go ahead. And this is something which is not new. We, so the problem that we have very often is ignorance in that field. Yeah. Okay, so it's very clear that within the Muslim communities there, are, there is debate, there is thinking, critical thinking, there is evolutions. So it's not a static, uh, you know, framework. That's clear. But then, you know, going to, to the second point is, you know, the inter dimensional uh, element between Muslims and non-Muslims being Muslim in an European context. I mean, you say, okay, you know, I don't have a problem. I am, you know, Muslim by religion and I'm Swiss by, by culture. Okay, maybe you don't have a problem, but there are many people who do have a problem, you know? So I wonder, so what do you do with this, with this fact that uh, there are many issues, you know, regarding 
everything what has to do with being different, you know. You say, okay, you know, regarding, you know, you're complex, you, you, you have different positions, you're intelligent, but then, you know, you have your name and, you know, your, your, your pass, uh, passport photo that kind of like ruins everything. So what do you do with this, this uh, with the fact that you are not accepted by the majority, although you want to be part of it? Yes, no, I, I think it's, it's not only a fair question, this is something which is dealing with daily life. Uh, and this is why, when I'm talking, very often talking to within uh, the Muslim communities in the West, what I understood is upstream from this daily life, there are psychological dimension that we have to touch and to tackle. And the psychological dimension is really to work on, look, now you have to understand that you are at home and be assertive and know your being and your right. <coughs> this is upstream, so you need to come with a strong discourse on this. At home, be confident, don't be scared. Now, it doesn't mean that it's enough in your daily life to solve the problem. Now you come to, how do you translate this in life? How do you do this? And this is why you have to come with all the dimensions. For example, in school, when you are in the school and when you are trying to get knowledge, is just to be here to work on something which is get the knowledge. Take the best of anything which has to do with school. And now, it's also to be critical within the school system by saying you have second-class schools in some areas. So it means that as citizens, you have to be active and not to culturalize, and this is why I said it, not to come as citizen only when we talk about Islam, but you have to come with these rights and these duties that you have within the society. So by, for example, being everywhere in education, in the social life, and never accept, never accept anyone who is telling you something which is a racist statement and xenophobia, you should act as a citizen and to stand up. So I want to nurture this mentality of not being a victim, of being a subject, of standing up and to act and not